Yes. There is recording. Okay, so today is January the 9th, 2021, and we have with us the famous, the legend, Vena Jones Cox. So I'm very excited about this. Uh, Vena and I have known each other for a long time. I've known her longer than she's known me because she was a somebody way back in the day. So Vena, first of all, thank you very much, very much agreeing to do this because I know that this is not your idea of fun when people start asking you questions about you. That is not something you really enjoy doing. Uh, it, it, it'll, it'll be okay. I'm sure. <laughs> it'll be okay. We'll see. <laughs> okay, so let's start with um, who are you and where do you live? Wow, oh, who am I? That's a really zen question there. I think, I think what you're probably asking is uh, I'm Vena Jones Cox. I was born and raised and continue to live in Cincinnati, Ohio. Okay, Th thank you very much for that flood of information. That's going to really help people a lot. So how long, when did you get started investing? How long have you been doing this? Uh, I bought my first rental house in 1989. I still own it. Um, it's, you know, that deal that made me look at it 20 years later and say, oh, that's interesting. I haven't done very much. And it's worth four times what I paid for it. And I owe almost nothing on it. There were a lot of other deals that I bought during that time that I don't own anymore and sort of wish I did. But uh, I started out with the same strategies that my father had used, which was buy a house with some sort of owner financing or private financing, um, stabilize it, put a tenant in it, refinance it with a bank, get the private money out and maybe get some extra cash and then hold on to it. Which was um, some one of those things you do because that's what you know how to do. And it didn't turn out that I really liked that strategy a lot, but I didn't know anything else. So uh, that was that that described the first four or five years of my real estate career. Just do that over and over and over again. It's changed since then. How so? Well, in around 1994 or five, I was at a, a Real Estate Investors Association of Greater Cincinnati meeting. And there was this young whippersnapper there named Ron Legrand, who was at the front of the room talking about this thing where you could just go put a property under contract and then you could uh, sell the contract to another investor and make three to $5,000 cash. That was the number he kept saying, three to $5,000 cash. Because remember it was 1994 or five and that was quite a bit of money really. And that you didn't have to fix it and you didn't have to deal with tenants and you didn't have to have the money to close it. And I sat in the back of the room thinking this is either the best thing I've ever heard or completely illegal and I'm not. <laughs> I'm not sure which because I've only just done this one thing over and over and over again. So I don't have the frame of reference to know whether this is really something or not. And I talked to a couple of other uh, of the younger RIA members who I thought might know something about it. And one of them said, oh yeah, I do that like once a month. It's great. And it's completely legal. And here's how you do it. So I took uh, three different credit cards and bought access to the, to the boot camp that he was selling at this meeting. And I drove up to Chicago with my then husband and spent four days in a youth hostel at $17 a night uh, because that was what I could afford. Because did I, did I mention that my strategy was buy properties with financing and, um, them up uh, often myself you know often painting in the middle of the night the day before the tenant was supposed to move in kind of thing I mean you know at, at at 25 I probably had more I could probably pull out a balance sheet and show you that I was richer 
than anybody that I went to college with, but that balance sheet doesn't actually let you trade what's on it for goods and services that you want. You know, you can't eat equity, as they say. So I went to the class, I took copious notes, I came home and did something that I don't know, people don't always do when they take a class, which is I actually went out and tried it. And I wholesaled my first deal a few months later. And I actually made um, 7,000 on that deal, which was just a miraculous amount of money to see all in the same place all at once. And I decided that that was what I wanted to do. And um, that, that created some friction because I, when I first, first started in real estate, I was working for my dad. I mean, it, 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 was, a, it was a family business. I had told him my, my entire teenage life that there was no way I was going into real estate. That was never going to happen. It sucked. What he did for a living was rip off old ladies, <laughs> all the stuff teenagers say to their parents. And I also, I mean, I had a very up close and personal view on what it is like to own and manage what were basically low income rentals, which is, you know, surprise middle of the night move outs, um, rent collection drama, uh, the, the, the 11 p.m. phone calls from people who seem to be um, mentally altered by various substances. <laughs> who would be screaming about my, my water, my water is leaking. And if you don't come over and fix it, I'm going to call the police and the building department and the FBI and the attorney general and everybody else. And, you know, when the question was asked, well, how long has this been going on? Three weeks. Oh, so you've, I've had a leak in my house for three weeks that you haven't told me about. That's awesome. And my dad was a, a, the word workaholic didn't really exist in his generation, but he was, he was somebody who was, you know, going to do whatever needed to be done to make sure that the food was on the table. He was a depression baby. And that included getting out of his pajamas at 1130 at night and driving over to some rental to examine a, a leak. And that, that, that just did not appeal to me in any way, form, or manner. Because of course, you know, you're a kid, like that's what you think this is. That's what you think this business is when you, when you see somebody doing it that way. So when I, I went to college expecting or wanting to be either a, I see at first it was a doctor and then it was a scientist and then it was a, a marketing person uh, and I had this particular company that I wanted to work for because it's a big Fortune 500 company here in Cincinnati. And I, when I got out of college, I applied with that company and they weren't hiring except through temporary services. They were, you had to be, you had to be a temp with a particular service before they would hire you. And I, so I went to work for that temp company and I was immediately hired on at this big company. And within about a week, I discovered that I absolutely hated corporate America. I know some people, it takes them years to discover that it was a week. Was this P&G? It might've been. And uh, of course, you know, I had, a, I had a super low level temp job and, you know, it was a lot of data entry and things like that. But the, the fact that it was a lot of data entry allowed me to sit there and enter data and observe what was happening around me. Listening into the conversations and seeing the, the power structure and whatnot. And um, the power structure at that company in 88, 89 involved, there, there were a lot of women who worked there, but they weren't really in charge of anything. They they were very deferential to the men. Um, you, you, you would see them talking to each other and they were clearly very intelligent, competent people. And then the guys would walk into the room and it would be all dirty jokes and, you know, <laughs> let, let, let's go to a, let's go play golf and get drunk. And the women would just be like, <laughs> and the only, the, the only Catherine, exception Catherine to that Hepburn was, types. Yes. The only, the only exception to that that I was able to observe there was, I, I don't know if they still own it, but at the time Procter and Gamble had a, had a beauty 
department. They had a beauty um, brand. Yeah. And that was totally run by women. And you would see that, you would see those women on the elevator and they just, you know, they were ignoring the men, talking amongst themselves. And I was like, yeah, so that, that was kind of what I was thinking, but that's not the department I was working in. And just the, the whole having to drag yourself out of bed at a certain hour of the day and dress a certain way and show up and act a certain way and not leave until they told you to, even if your work for the day was done. I, it just was not appealing. I don't know what I thought it was going to be like, but I'm pretty sure that my idea of corporate America was built from watching LA law and those guys <laughs> seemed to do just whatever they wanted, whatever they wanted and didn't have these like really cool high profile things that they did. So I was offered a, a permanent job there when my temp contract expired and I said, well, I'm going to have to think about it. And I went home and never called them again. So that was, um, that was an interesting moment because I was still fairly fresh out of college. I was married to a guy whose degree was in aerospace engineering. And in the late eighties, there was a, there was a, a, a dip in that market. Let me say that Boeing had just laid off like, I don't know, 17,000 engineers or something. And that was, you know, he's brand new electrical uh, aerospace engineer. So we were looking at jobs in Germany and, you know, what, what are we going to do now? Neither one of us has a job. And my, my uh, father called me and he said, uh, I heard you decided not to go to work for that big fortune 500 company. Um, my secretary just quit. So if you want to come over here and fill in for a while, uh, you know, I can, I can pay you this piddling salary, but of course you're building up your estate because, you know, eventually I'm going to die and all this is going to belong to you and your four brothers and sisters. <laughs> and you're going to do the work. <laughs> exactly. The work falls but, on your shoulders though. Yes. And, and, and seriously, the offer was 16,000 a year. Which even in even in then it was that that was a low 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 amount. It was I I could have made the same money waitressing, but that didn't sound all that appealing either. So um, I I went to work for him, uh, and I told him this is just temporary, because I knew I knew what the job was because I would work for him summers, not because I wanted to but because he had this very strong idea that in a family business, the entire family works. So I knew what it was going to be. It was going to be answering tenant calls and delivering notices and dropping things off to places. And I'd been there about a week and my mother walked into the office at the house and said, Clarence, I've decided that we have enough properties. And so I, my mother, am not going to do what I've been doing for the last 20 years, which is go out and look for properties and make offers and, you know, deal with all of the closings and all of, all of that sort of thing. And my dad looked over to me and said, well, I guess that's your job now. <laughs> did, 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 I, did I mention that they, there's still office politics in family businesses? <laughs> Because when I think back on that now, and I think your wife just told you that she's uncomfortable with the level of um, acquisition that you have done and that she would like it to stop. And instead of talking that through with her and saying, why are you uncomfortable? What could make you comfortable? You basically turned around and said, well, I'm going to keep doing it and I'm going to use our daughter to do it instead <laughs> with no further discussion. At the time, it, you know, it was just sort of like, oh, okay, I don't know how to do that, but does it pay more? <laughs> you know? So that set me um, on, the, on the path of it's my job to acquire as many of the kind of property he wants as I can. And I don't really know how to find values. I don't really know how to, I should, certainly don't know how to estimate repair costs. I have no clue about that. 
but he would send me out to properties and I would write down everything I could see that it needed. And he would tell me what he thought that would cost. And I would write, you know, I'd calculate the offer and I'd call the real estate agent and I'd say, let's meet and write offers. And I would write my, 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 my strategy was I would look at houses three days a week and these were all on MLS. And I say on MLS, like that was on a computer. They were in books. That was a book. That was a book. They were books. No, yeah. no internet back then. Yeah, I would, you would the, the, have to go through the book and there were these little thumbnails that had a tiny black and white dotted picture. And then just, you know, it's this many rooms and this many bedrooms and this square footage and here's the price and um, uh, agent's phone number. And you would have to call all the agents and set up separate appointments on each property. So uh, I would start the week before and I would try to set up 10 showings kind of in the same part of town each day for three days a week. And what I did on the days in between was I wrote offers. So it was the goal, the goal was always 30 properties a week. It never worked out that way because it would turn out the property was pending because, you know, they only updated the books. You got an update once a week and a full update once a month. So it would usually end up being about 25 properties every week. I got, I got to be there for a second because there's, there's two areas when we both started that intersected. And I found this out last year when we were, we were just, you know, talking and I didn't know this before. The first was in 1982, I interviewed with P&G and got a, a job offer. So I was supposed to go to work for them. And I had a choice between that or stay with Electrox. I had just graduated and was like, which one do I do? And Electrox was going to pay about, pay about three, a little over three times as much. So I stayed with them. But we both had P&G in our background and both didn't last very long. In my case, I never even started. I went through the interview process and was all excited about getting the, the sheet saying, hey, you, we, we're going to offer you this job. And then it was like, I can't go do that. The other one is go back to what you just said, because this is where you and I were also in line. What, what was the number of written offers you were making in the, a week in the beginning? What was your number? It was 25. Uh, the goal was 30, but it never worked out that way because of, you know, they were listed properties. I didn't have any control over. Did they sell? Were they accessible? Was there a, was there actually a key there when I got there? And again, not, not to be all, God, I'm so old, but we, we didn't have cell phones. I got my, I got my first bag phone, which was incredibly expensive, cost 25 cents a minute to talk on and only worked in about three parts of town sometime in the early nineties. So when the key wasn't there, you had to go find a phone booth. I, I, I carried, I started when there were dimes, the phone call was a dime, it switched to a quarter. But when I first started, it was a dime and you carried dimes and then quarters in your pocket. But the phone booths were everywhere. Pay phones mm -hmm. were everywhere. I mean, you, it wasn't hard to find one. But there, so yeah. the other thing that we have in common is my number when I started was 25 written offers. And I know that we, we both talked to a lot of people who are starting off and saying, what does it take? How important is it, do you think, for people that are starting? Or, or building to, to make reg, you know, make a, a number of written offers every week. Maybe their number is not 25, but whatever their number is, is to be out there making the written offers. Well, as, as you know, uh, your obsession with written offers is different than the way I would say make offers. Yeah. Uh, the reason I was making written offers was because these were real estate agents representing the sellers and there was there was no real way to make an offer without putting it on the you know what was then a three page form and is now like a 16 page form that was that 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 was what was expected that was what was practical calling an agent and saying this is what i'd like to pay would most of the time result in the agent not calling the seller and telling them that because my offers were typically lower than uh asking price. I don't think I ever made an asking price offer during that entire period. It is extraordinarily important for people who are starting out to talk to as many sellers as possible and tell them what, tell the seller what they can do for the seller. So it's an offer, but I'm not obsessed with putting it in writing. I'm obsessed with the conversations with the sellers 
uh, partly just for the practice of understanding that there are lots of different kinds of sellers in the world. Heck, there are lots of different kinds of people in the world. There are, there are sellers that the way you talk to them is the way I'm talking to you, which is very slowly and deliberately and uh, picking my words and, and trying to be as clear as possible. And there are sellers that you talk to and it becomes clear within a minute or two that they're fairly sophisticated investors. And you can shortcut that. You can, you can say things like, well, listen, uh, Bill, the only, the only way I'd be willing to buy that property, and I don't think this is going to surprise you, would be if you do something like a sub two deal. I would never say that to a civilian, but if it became clear that the seller was, you know, a, a no nonsense, get to it, talk fast, uh, I understand your language kind of person, that's how I'm going to talk to them. So understanding that there are lots of different ways that people communicate and then that there are sellers who are not motivated and have no reason to be motivated. Like they, they just don't have a problem. I kind of like my house. I don't need the money. I have all the time in the world to sell it. And if I don't sell it, I'm okay with that too. And then there are sellers who are, if I don't sell this thing by next week, it's gonna get taken away from me by the tax people or the sheriff or the bank or whatever. That, that practice is just absolutely invaluable. And that means you're gonna to talk to literally 20 to 25 times more sellers than you make deals. But that's part of the work of being a real estate entrepreneur. What happens to investors who don't do that? Let's, let's say they're talking to maybe 10 sellers a year. Numerically, the chances that one of those 10 sellers is going to have the right deal at the right price is close to zero. It, 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 is, it is very much a numbers game, and it's a lot of sorting through the chaff <laughs> you know, to get to the wheat. So your goal should be generate and generate and deal with as much chaff as you possibly, possibly, possibly can. And it's important that even, even the sellers who don't, who clearly, they're not going to accept your offer. They're the, I don't need to sell. I certainly don't need to sell right now. I want top price. I've got a great house. I love my house. People, you still tell them what you can do for them. Even when you're certain that they're going to say, what are you nuts? You got you to gotta make the offer verbally. And the, the way that I teach people to do that and that I do it with those clearly non-motivated sellers is kind of a takeaway close. It's, okay, listen, Bill, I've, I've heard everything you've said. You love your house. You don't really need to sell it. Let me explain a little bit about what my business is and where I can help people. I typically buy distressed properties that are in distressed situations at prices and terms that reflect that and that also make the seller and I happy. On your house, I know it's not distressed, but you're asking 150. And I'm guessing from what you've told me about it that my offer is going to come in at a little bit south of 100. And I don't think that that is going to meet your needs. Am I wrong? And then they say, I would never take anything like that. And I say, I, I didn't think you would, which means that I'm not the solution to your problem and neither is anybody like me. And your absolute best bet is to list it with a real estate agent. Is there some reason you haven't done that? And the reason I, always, I asked that last question is because then some Sometimes something comes out that hasn't been said up until that point. Like for instance, they might say, well, I called a couple of agents and they said I couldn't get the 150 for it. Or mm -hmm. I called a couple of agents and they said I was going to have to get rid of the black mold on all the walls <laughs> before, I, before I started showing it. Well, and now we can reopen the conversation because I just found out that they actually know they're not, they don't have a great house in a great area. But 
just saying that over and over and over again, it, it, I rarely get surprised when I have determined from the questions I've asked and the conversation I've had that the people aren't determined or aren't uh, motivated. I rarely get surprised by them saying, well, actually, you know, 99,000, it'd be fine. But it happens often enough and I've made enough money doing that that it's 100% worth doing. You know, it might only happen twice a year. But those two deals a year are, you know, $10,000 deals, 50,000 in equity deals. And everybody else thanks me for my help and agrees that we can't work together and goes on with their lives. What, what, type, what type of investing are you doing today? What is oh, your, you, you know, like today, today? Cause to, that, well, not, not, not today as in, yeah, let's just say not so much the, the, the virus thing, but as far as, as, as you work these days and where you are, cause you come a long way, what is it? Cause you, there's a lot of irons you have in the fire. I do. Have what type of investing? I do have a lot of irons in the fire and it, that, that is not, that's not a strategy I recommend to most people. For most people, less irons equals, you know, more forging. Um, today, today, I'm driving out to Indiana to look at a $400,000 property. Now, folks who are from the coast are going to go, okay, so a starter home. No, not <laughs> Cincinnati. <laughs> In Cincinnati, that's a definitely move up type property. That's, that's in probably the top 10% of house prices here in the Cincinnati area. And that's not my bread and butter type of property. That's, you know, what I, what I usually look for is a rental that's in the 120 to 180 range, or I look for a deal that's a, a potential retail deal for someone else. I don't do retail deals. That's in the 150 to, you know, maybe as much as 400 range. And in that case, I would wholesale it. Or I look for things that are potential uh, repair for equity deals. They're ugly but livable houses that somebody with some skills can move into and buy from me from owner for, with owner financing. This particular property, because of the strange underlying situation, is uh, something that I'm probably going to either option or I'm going to try to buy it subject to her existing loan and I will turn around and lease option it. So because I am not terribly uh, attached to any particular exit strategy other than I don't do retailing because I don't like any part of that process of fixing up and selling properties. It's, it's really, I don't know what's happening this week. It's, it's more, what, what have I tried and I don't do anymore because I decided it's not my genius zone. I don't, I don't, I don't love the things that you have to do to do it. Um, I stick primarily to single family houses. Uh, I've owned apartment buildings. I sold it. I sold the ones I owned because I just don't, I don't love that, the drama of that tenant class. Like apparently when you, when you put people so close together that they share a wall, they become children and they, they call you every time the neighbor is playing the music too loud, rather than go knock on the door next door and say, uh, Hey, would you mind turning down the music? They expect you to come over and fix it. And they also can't take care of their toys. You know, the constant, the constant, uh, somebody threw up in the hallway and didn't clean it up. Will you come? <laughs> I guess I should add the, the big apartment building I owned was in a college area. So oh. I, I might have, I might have somewhat been victim of renting to 19 to 23 year olds. But um, even I, I have a, I have a remaining four family that I'm in the process of, of potentially selling here. And we get the call all the time. Somebody left their laundry in the laundry room and it's on top of the washer and I can't, I can't use the washer. We'll move the basket. They didn't, put it in, they didn't put it in a basket. They just left it in a big wet heap on top of the washer. Okay, so go get a garbage bag, put the laundry in, put it in the corner, and don't tell anybody what you did. They'll figure it out. You know, it, it's. 
I, I try to, I try to ha have a lot of drama in my life and apartment buildings when you are managing them yourself, or I actually, actually have a full-time salaried property manager, but I still get to hear all this stuff. Um, multifamilies is just not my forte, apparently. So For I don't sure. do apartments. <laughs> I don't do apartments. I don't do commercial. Um, I do a lot of single family homes, but then what do I do with them? I don't know. Tell me about the property. I, I really consider myself a deal finder rather than a wholesaler or a creative finance person or a lease option person or a repair for equity person. You, you tell me about your deal and I will know what to do with it if we can agree on a price. So you've learned over the years many different ways to structure. In other words, we, we, we use the word structure, but what we're really saying is to solve their problem. To solve their problem, and then it's super important that you know how you, it's going to then not become a problem to you. you. You really have to know what are the numbers going to look like, not, not in fantasy world, but in real world where things go wrong and there's uh, problems with the property that aren't easily visible and uh, there's, you know, eviction bans and, you know, you gotta, you gotta make, you gotta make safe deals. Even to this day, I think I'm incredibly conservative. I always, I always try and guess the, the reasonable worst case scenario. I don't, I don't run numbers based on, well, a meteor is going to fall from the sky and it's going to wake up Godzilla and he's going to destroy my house and gosh, my insurance doesn't cover Godzilla. So I guess I'm just in big trouble if that happens. But, but you know, realistic bad scenarios that could happen and decide if the deal is worth that risk and go forward that way. What made you stick as a real estate investor? Why real estate investing? I know you're, and by the way, are you second generation or third generation? Well, it depends. Um, my grandmother on my father's side uh, did own a four family that she bought in the 1950s and owned until she died. That's your third generation. And also apparently um, spent a lot of time complaining at her husband about how they never should have sold the house that they built and then moved out of that look look what it's worth now we could have rented it this entire time so i think she had the she had this the sort of attitude of a real estate investor i think if you'd asked her she would have said no i'm not a real estate investor but the four the the four family that continued to support her until the day she died would be why that <laughs> yeah so you're, you're third generation so what made you stick? Because again, you know, a lot of times you, you see a lot of people, they're kids of real estate investors, and you described it great before where you're, as a kid, you're watching what your parents go through or you're hauled in to help clean it out. And you're like, I'll never do that. You know, how many people do we meet that have the, the offspring of the people who own the mobile home park? There's no way the offspring string, spring will ever own the mobile home park. They, they hate mobile homes. They hate mobile home parks. So what made you stick? Well, it was a combination of once I didn't have a job, I, the, the idea of having one just was, I, I don't want to say it was horrible. It was like unimaginable that I'm, I'm going to go back to working for someone else. And it was also, um, I, just, I just found real estate to be really stimulating in every way. I, I, I thought it was fascinating. I, I was interested in learning things that I didn't even think I had any intention of doing just because it was super interesting. Um, I, have a, I have book knowledge of a lot of stuff I've never even done because I was like, wait a minute, how does that work? That's, wait a minute, how did, so, so when you buy the tax lien, then what happens? You know, I've never bought a tax lien in my life. I, I just happen to, you know, I get, I get the course and I read it and I'm like, oh, that's really interesting. And maybe there's something here I can apply to what I do do. I think looking back, the real, real, real reason, the thing that never made me quit, even, even when my then husband and I were having to have sit downs to say, the property that we sold on lease option that was supposed to close this month 
and we had depended on that money, that payoff at the end to close this month, is not going to close. It's not going to close this month and maybe not ever. So what, what bills can we cut back on that we haven't already? And there, were, there was a point in time where we canceled paper delivery, we canceled basic cable, we were, you know, keeping the house at 64 degrees. I mean, it was, <laughs> and th those challenges always turned out to be temporary. You know, the next month, one, a, a lease option that we'd sold that we didn't expect to close for five more months would close, and all of a sudden there's $25,000 in the bank account. So they were temporary, but boy, they don't feel temporary when they're happening. Yeah, they feel, they feel like we're on the edge of bankruptcy here or something. And it was, you know, it, it, it always felt like at the beginning that we could never get permanently ahead. And what really resolved that was wholesaling. It was discovering wholesaling. And uh, the, 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 end of the, the end of the working for my dad's story ended up being... I went to that class. I went to that class Ronald, in Chicago. Ronald Grand. Yep. I came back and I had to sit down with my dad because it was just so obvious to me that this was the missing piece of the family business. You know, we needed to, we needed to take the properties that I was making offers on that he didn't want for some reason or another. And we needed to wholesale them to other investors and, and bring that cash in. And he explained to me that um, that was a terrible idea because you'd have to pay taxes on the, on the profit and there would be no depreciation and um, it was just bad in every way. Oh, and the other guy would be making all the money because, you know, you'd get $5,000 and the other guy would get equity and tax breaks and cash flow forever. And I said, but I want to do it. And he said, well, you can't do it and work for me because then you'd be competing with me. And I said, well, <laughs> I guess that means I'm not going to work for you anymore because I'm making, at that point it was 18,000 a year. And that's like four of these, I mean, I'm making $18,000 a year, literally buying 30 houses a year for you. God, you don't like being underpaid. Like, well, but you know, I was going to inherit all that money. Along, along with the rest of your family. Yes, along with everybody else. So um, I said, well, you know, we're going to do this. And uh, so I guess that means I resign. Uh, and, and a piece of the story that I left out was when he hired me, he also hired my ex-husband because my dad was an engineer and he really loved the idea of having an engineer working for him. And Jason's job was, so aerospace engineer, highly trained and specialized person. What he was doing was making AutoCAD drawings of kitchens. And he was, he was uh, making, making very precise for sale signs. Like it was not at all <laughs> what he had hoped to get out of his life. Um, so I said, I, get, I said, well, you know, I'm going to resign then. And he said, well, if I don't have you to buy the houses, I don't need Jason either. And he fired my husband the day I resigned. <laughs> so they were both out of a job. But I was, I was actually really excited about that because I, you know, with my, with my basically zero experience in wholesaling, I was, I did, I did the math and I'm like, this is just going to be more money. <laughs> like there's, there's no way this isn't going to be more money. But back to your question about why did I stick? The real, 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 real reason as I look back on it is I plugged into that community at Cincinnati RIA really hard right from the beginning. I, at the, the first couple of meetings I went to, I gravitated toward the people who were sort of my age in the same situation as I was in, um, do, sometimes doing the same thing, sometimes not, but it, it allowed me to look at those people and go, well, I could be, that's something I could add to my business as well. And 
I knew after two or three meetings that these are my peeps, you know, the, the, the high school and college friends that I've been hanging out with who were like, you do what now? I, I don't, I don't, I don't actually believe that the $25,000 in equity that you got in that house is valuable at all. Cause you got to sell the house to get like, they didn't, they didn't get it. They didn't get anything about it. And they thought I was lazy cause I worked from home or worked for, for my dad or whatever. Um, the folks there got it. And in addition to my, my peers in my same age group, I found that uh, the, the older folks who I didn't know to call estate builders or enders at the time were super open to helping me if I would just, if I would just ask, if I would just come up and say, listen, I, there's a deal that I kind of want to run by you. And I would, I would actually have the details of the deal. I wasn't asking them what's a deal. I was saying I'm, I'm buying a property and I'm thinking about buying a property in Spring Grove Village and I never heard of Spring Grove Village before last week, but it seems to be kind of a blue collar mixed industrial area. Do you have any opinion on that? And they say, oh, did you know there's a new dump going in right down there on Madison Street and, and it's going to just destroy the whole neighborhood and I hope you're not paying much for it. That they were they were super open to just about anything I wanted to know. So when I say I plugged in hard, uh, I was at every meeting. When they said, who wants to run for the board? I was like, me, I don't know what that is. But um, if it's going to get me closer to the folks who seem to be doing a lot of stuff, you know, sure, whatever. And the, the president, the guy who's the president at the time, said, it'll be great. It's only like two hours of work a month. <laughs> <laughs> they said that to me back in, I think my first year on the board was 95. And he was such a liar. I, mean, <laughs> I, guess, I guess a lot of people who were on the board were working two hours a month, but it immediately became like a several hour a week job for me because I was like, this group could be better if, I, if we just did this, 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 and this. And then the board would be like, okay, that sounds good. Go do it. And I'd be like, okay, <laughs> I don't have a job. So it's, it's basically been about 10 hours a week since then, like, like every week of my life since 1995 in working, working on and with that association. But if it, if it hadn't been for being able to really constantly be around people who could encourage me, who could kick me in the butt, when I needed to be kicked in the butt, which was sometimes who would tell me the, the truth. I mean, I remember that that guy who was the president was also a very plain spoken person. He, he didn't, he didn't mess around with niceties. And I would say, I love people like that. <laughs> I, I would say, I'm going to do this. And he'd say, you're not ready. And I'd be like, <laughs> but I'm so smart. And I've done, I've done like 35 real estate deals. I, how can you say I'm not ready? But he was always right. So it was, it was largely just making sure that, I, and I wasn't, it, I didn't go in saying, well, I'm going to make sure I have people around me who are like-minded. But that was, that was what got me through a lot of the difficult mental times, market times, financial times, all of that stuff. Did you know back then when you were starting off and you're learning again, you're learning wholesaling because you had some you know, time in you by then. Did you foresee then anywhere close to where you are now? Oh, no, no. I, I foresaw much bigger things. Than really? I like yes, what? Be, well, okay. So I had, a, I had a goal back in the 90s. It's written down on one of my New Year's resolution things to own 1,200 rental properties. 1200 single family homes. Wow. I had as a goal to do a hundred wholesale deals a year. Yeah. 10 a month. And that was one of those goals that you set when you're more focused on, boy, that would be cool. People would think I was awesome. I would, I, 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 would have millions of dollars a year in equity and income and you're not thinking about, but what would my life look like if I did that? 
what I, I, even with a fairly sizable staff to help out with that you probably are giving up everything else in your life yep. for four to five years at least and so you know no family no relationship no hobbies no travel no 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 pete 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 <laughs> yeah so those are those sound really cool but the reality is what you need is a balance between i have enough income assets wherever wherever those are coming from that I don't worry about money. You know, my, my worries are more along the lines of, my money worries are more along the lines of how do I pay as little taxes as legally possible? How do I, how do I generate enough money right now to do this one thing that I'm trying to do? But if I don't do that thing, it's like, not, I'm not starving. It's just something I'd like to do and have as much time as humanly possible to live as a human being. Pursuing the things that you love doing. The, the things that you love doing, the things that are meaningful to you, the things that, that make you on your deathbed say that was a good life. Okay, you're a, you are a very, very good writer. You know I like reading the things you've written. Um, the best example happened last year when you had sent me something on a course we we're working on and my bedtime is like between eight and nine o'clock at night and you sent it to me about nine right I was just heading to bed and I thought well let me just look over this real fast and then as it as it turns out I, I think I ended up calling you because I, I couldn't stop I couldn't put it down so how did you become such a good writer I don't know the answer to that question I just wrote a lot do you love to write I do love to write. Do you love words? I do love words. They're like paint brushes and paints. I'm terrible. I'm terrible at any kind of graphical art, but I sort of treat the words like they were art. Well, you build great word pictures. And a lot of times when I'm reading what you're writing, there's always a snicker in there. You know, I will sit there and get a smile going because you're saying something and it still helps get the point across. But I really, I, I don't, I don't see that turn coming. And I don't see a lot of people, a lot of times when you read uh, someone's manuals, their manuals, it, it's, you know, just is blah, 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 blah. And yours never have been. Where did you learn to write? Just did it? And that, that's just one of those, that's just one of those things that another thing, I guess, that I was attracted to and wanted to be good at. And I've, like you, I've probably written millions of words of articles and manuals and just, you know, thing, things for discussion. And so, yes, after millions of words, I'm, I'm pretty good at it. And enjoy doing it. You can tell that you enjoy doing it. Um, when you were starting, what were your biggest hurdles? Um, I would say that it, like, like with everybody else, it was a lot of fear of the unknown and hesitating to get out there and practice what I knew and procrastination. Um, the biggest personal hurdle I had by far was a nearly crippling social anxiety. I mean, to the point where I would not call and order a pizza because you had to do that back then. You had to pick up the phone and call the pizza place and talk to a stranger. And I would have my husband do it. Like I would have anybody do it except for what, me. Why didn't you want to call the pizza place? Because then I had to talk to a stranger and it could be embarrassing. Okay, you're, you're doing real estate where you're going out and you're talking to people every day. And again, you had, you're, you're an introvert. So how did, how did you overcome this? Because that's a big I, one. I said it was a hurdle. Uh, so for the first couple of years, it was easy enough for me to not 
kind of talk to people without being the responsible party because my dad, I'm doing this, you know, my, my do this for my dad and my dad's company. He has a lot of experience. And um, I mean, I preferred to see vacant houses where I could just show them to myself. But uh, when I had to talk to a human being, I just tried to, you know, ask questions. With the, it looks like there's a leak up here. Do you know where it's coming from? That sort of thing. And the big, the big thing that I, I had to make it my intention to overcome because I saw pretty quickly that it was going to be a huge problem was my method for making those written offers you're talking about was always either make them through a third party so that the other agent was the one who was going to get yelled at if the <laughs> owner didn't like it. Or if I was working directly with a seller, I would say something really vague as I was leaving the property like that. Well, you know, I, I think we are interested. I'm not sure about the price yet. Let me go home and crunch some numbers and um, I'll, uh, I'll get back to you on the price. Now, in reality, by the time I'd seen my 200th house, which was six months in, because I saw a lot of houses <laughs> during that time, I knew what I was going to be able to pay. I, I, I knew it by the time I had arrived back at the seller's living room, but I didn't want to say it because I didn't want anybody to be mad or offended or didn't want any uncomfortable situations or interactions or feelings. So I would go home, I would write the offer, I would wrap it up and put it in an envelope. And then in the middle of the night, I would go <laughs> and open the cell screen door and slide that envelope in and close the door. And then I wouldn't answer the phone all day. I would just let it go to voicemail so that it would go to my cell. And I had, I had to literally just warm it up on that one. Um, I, I, I realized, because I, I, by that time, I also had a partner, Drew, who loves that kind of thing. Like, it's his favorite, favorite thing to do to negotiate with people. He, he enjoys it. He would do it. He would do it for fun if he didn't do it for a living. And he was a crutch there for a while. I was the one who had all the real estate knowledge, but he would be the one who went and said the words. And I, he, he was somewhat reliable about actually contacting people and whatnot, but not reliable enough for, you know, me who was responsible for all the, you know, I, I was paying for all the marketing and I had to have money coming in to cover stuff. And he was just the sales guy. So, one day I went, you know what? I've just got to get comfortable with negotiating. And I set a goal for myself that for the next 30 days, I would negotiate everything. If I was in line at Kroger with groceries and the, the bill came up, I would say, so I would look down at the name tag, you know, of the cashier and I would say, so what's the friend of Josie discount? <laughs> you know just sort of in a joking way but i got discounts on almost everything and barely like literally josie would say well there's coupons for some of the stuff you bought and you didn't give them to me but here they are <laughs> and she'd scan the coupons and i'd save you know seven dollars on my 200 hundred dollar grocery bill um and i remember at that time i had to go <laughs> I had to go buy a laser printer, which was a big deal back then because they were very expensive and you could only buy them at a certain number of places. And I sat in that store. I found, I found one that was a, um, it was discontinued uh, floor model and they discounted it by a couple hundred dollars. And I called the sales, the sales dude over and I said, I'll give you, I think they were asking 1800. I said, I'll give you 1400 for this printer. And he said, but it's 1800. And I said, but I'll give you 1400. I mean, it's discontinued. It's been used by everybody who's come through here and tested it for God knows how long. So it's used and what are you going to do with it? And he said, well, I, it, it, but it's $1,800. <laughs> Let me see your manager. Okay. I stood in that store for two and a half hours. Oh, bless <laughs> our hearts. The, while the manager, uh, finally decided it was worth 400 bucks to get rid of me because I paid $1,400 for that laser printer. And the, and the thing was, because that was a game. I mean, real estate wasn't a game to me. Real estate was how I make my living. That was a game. I didn't really care if I got that thing for $1,400 or not. I learned 
that if you approach it right, if you approach the conversation right and, you know, make it, make it not a matter of life and death to you, it, people don't really yell at you. I didn't get kicked out of any stores. I didn't get, you know, shouted at. If you're, if you're nice and you build rapport and you say things like, I, look, I totally understand your position. You were told to mark this down to $1,800, but come on, between you and me, isn't this thing just going to sit here forever at $1,800? <laughs> I'm trying to help you here. I'm trying to get this thing off your shelf so you can put a new model on. Um, people are basically pretty nice, and when they do yell at you, you still don't die. Mm -hmm. God, that was good. <laughs> Let's move you forward to middle years. You're an estate builder. You're gathering property, gathering notes. You've done 40, 50, 60, 70 deals. What were some of the roadblocks you were running into then? And how, how were they different from you, the roadblocks you ran in as a starter? I delayed the estate building stage for a really long time. And how come? Because you're dead? No, I've already, I've already told you the reason. I didn't do it on purpose. I didn't know what an estate builder was. I did it through my own behaviors and decisions. Once I started wholesaling properties, I basically stopped acquiring them. I had the properties that I had bought up to that point is probably 12 to 18. A lot of them were lease options. So they would go off the balance sheet from time to time. Um, I wasn't really interested in acquiring properties when I could just wholesale them, be done with them, make you know, over time, the amount of money that was the average wholesale fee went up. It just seems so much easier and so much more. I, it, it attracted me because my, my personality attracts me to income events instead of long-term projects. And that, that's true across the board. Like everything I, everything I do, I'm much, I'm much more interested in fascinated with likely to do something that creates an income event and then is over and i don't have to think about it anymore so there's there's a, a week or two worth of run up it happens i can feel good about it i can move on to the next thing it's i've, I've got a i've got entrepreneurial add like a lot of people do and while i understand the value of being in the weeds on a really long-term project and continuing to effort it and effort it and effort it and, and get a different long-term result, it is not what I am naturally attracted to. I just described owning rentals. It is a long-term in the weeds project that you don't, um, it, it doesn't ever end, right? You never, you never get the rental all squared away and you just never have to think about it again, except to, collect rents and that I hate that moment when whatever project you've been working on and you thought it was kind of done and going to operate on auto autopilot, something happens and you have to go back to it. That's just not, I'm, 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 I'm more of like a high level. I'm, I'm good at planning. I'm good at seeing all the outcomes of things. I'm good at um, doing stuff if I don't have to focus on it over a long period of time. So the real lack in my life there was not that because that's, people tend to be one way or another. They're either high level, do it, move on to the next thing, or they're, I love the weeds. The weeds are my favorite part. I love making spreadsheets and then tracking them every day. It's all, it's all so good. I like, I like, I like making the trains run on time. And then there's people who are like, I like inventing new trains. And that's, that's me. The real lack was that I didn't understand that you can and should pay people who love the weeds to be in the weeds while you go do the stuff that you like and enjoy and profit from. Excellent point. So you're talking about hiring a property manager to manage those properties for you so you don't have to be in the weeds. Yes. And, and my, a big part of my, uh, limiting beliefs on that because that's exactly what it was. I just I thought that worked a certain way because that's how my dad did it. Uh, my dad was a very um, 
control freak micromanager. And I experienced that myself for two years. And so his management of people was really telling them every day in detail how to do their jobs and then complaining about it when it, they did it any other way, even if it was effective, right? And I didn't want, I didn't want to do that. Like, I was like, it, it will take me longer to tell somebody else how to do this than it takes me to do it myself. And I didn't understand the thing about everybody in the world isn't me. And there are people who love this kind of stuff and are ex they're much better at it than I am. So I read, e I read the EMF, which I think should be on the must read list for all real estate entrepreneurs and business owners. And I, what I got out of it was, oh, I should be hiring people, but I still didn't get the depth of, I should be hiring people who aren't me. So my first, it took me a long time to make the decision to hire because I also had all that stuff in my head that everybody else has about, well, I can't afford it. I've got to save up $15,000 for their first six months worth of salary so I can be safe. I didn't get that. No, it's actually their job to generate that money. As, as long as I've got two weeks worth of money put aside for them, if in two weeks they're not making more than what they're costing me, they need to go away and I need to find somebody who can do that. I waited too long to hire. When I did hire, I hired the wrong people. I hired people that I liked, which was people like me, which is exactly the opposite of what I should be hiring. And there were several times I gave up, you know, somebody, I fired somebody or they left and I was like, fine, I'm just going to go back to doing it myself. And then as wrong person I, on the wrong seat in the wrong seat. Exactly. As I, as I read more and talked more to the, those same people that were starting out with me, at RIA in the early 90s, they, many of them did have successful staffs and, and you're know, talking to them because that's the thing is you come up, you all come up and can share things that you're doing right and the other person isn't. And I, um, I finally kind of got all that stuff together in my head and started personality testing people before I hired them and being real specific about the things that I was looking for and, and being real specific about this is, this is your lane and you own that lane. And the only reason you have to ask me about anything is if there's something that comes up that's unusual and, and then call me. And I have like an amazing property manager who has exactly the right combination of toughness and um, sympathy uh, Brooks, no, you know, bull from tenants and contractors. Uh, there, there have been months when she's been at 105% rent collection because people pay their late fees and their court costs with her involved. Um, I have a great bookkeeper. I, I don't, you know, I look at, I obviously look at the books, but I don't have to worry that something's being done wrong and I don't have to worry about going in and doing a really deep dive and looking at every entry because that sort of thing makes my eyes bleed. Like bookkeeping is the worst. Um, I have great people on the, on my RIA and speaking side of the business who, are, who love talking to people and are wonderful customer service people. So I can kind of stand back here and be the person who does the big picture programming and marketing and all of those sorts of things. It's, it's really good when you figure out how that works. Neat. One of the phrases I've, I've I learned a long time ago was know your cadence. And it sounds like you have, you know, your cadence, you know what you're good at and you know what you have to have the people you have to have around you taking care of the things that you're not so good at. And that, yeah, that that is, saying that you're not good at is the wrong phrase. It's just saying you just don't like doing. And, and it's something even bigger than not good at it and don't like it. There's, there's things that I am good at, but they are a waste of the stuff that I'm excellent at. When I'm, when I'm doing those things and, and disliking every minute of it, it's keeping me away from something that I'm really, really good at and enjoy and that also makes a lot of money. And that, 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 that is probably the best point you've made all day because I know that when we were building the business, I found out the place I needed to be was the kitchen table, period, kitchen table. And re-roofing a house or going to Home Depot or doing the books or anything else was not important. 
because the thing that I couldn't bring anybody else in to do was the kitchen table, being at that kitchen table and asking those questions. In your case, it's being up on stage and, and teaching, the writing that you do, putting together the courses. And then, like you said, you know, when you're going out and you're talking to sellers. Um, and, and you just made it sound like I don't do anything except no. teach and do Rio stuff. And structuring creative deals. Yeah, that, that, that was and, how I finished up. Because when you're out there, you're talking to sellers. And marketing for deals. I'm, I'm really good at that. And um, raising private money. I mean, those are, those, are, those are the things I do. I also am, am good at uh, like inspecting houses and estimating repair costs. But I try to only do that when the end deal is probably going to be a creative one because Drew is also very good at that. He's perfectly capable of saying, here's how much cash we can pay, but he hasn't done the study I have because, because now remember I said I was, he was a crutch for me in the negotiation world. Now I'm a crutch for him in the creative finance. Well, he doesn't understand half the do, deals we do, but he's, he's fine with collecting the money from them. But it also goes back to, you said that you were fascinated by the creative side. You know, you, you, and the helping of people. If you had a message to pass along to like starters and estate builders, what are, what are some of the big messages you would, you would tell them? Cause they're, they're, let's start with starters. They're, they're just getting started. What are the, what's, what's the big message for them? Plug into a, a good community. Unfortunately, not every real estate association or meetup group or whatever has a good culture where everybody is there to help everybody else. And I'm very aware that some of them seem to be more sales organizations than they are communities. It's more about what course are we going to sell you this week than it is about what else can we do for you to help you be successful. But if you can find a good community, no, let me, let me say it a different way. Just go find a good community. And nowadays with Zoom and everything else and the internet, you can find great communities. Right. You're not limited to the one spot. And I always use Enterprise Alabama and the RIA that was in Enterprise Alabama, you know, which was a 30-person organization compared to, let's say, what you have in Cincinnati where you have you know, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of members, you know, thousands of members. But you can go to that. Because now, uh, because of what we have on the internet and Zoom. Yes. And a lot of those, uh, okay, well, let me go back to the example of Cincinnati RIA. Cincinnati RIA and then the sister group in Columbus, which is called Simple Ohio Real Estate Entrepreneurs, has found that of the new members over the last 10 months, something like 20% of them are from areas where they would never come to a live meet. I mean, they're in Arizona or they're in California or Florida or Georgia. And it's because a good community is a good community is a good community. Mm -hmm. And it has members of those groups have really embraced these folks and said, Oh, Hey, sorry, there's no good Rhea in your area, but what can we do for you? And yes, there, it, it has opened up the possibility of your community is not, is not necessarily in your area. However, um, when it goes back to live, you, you may end up having to go to a few different groups to find what you're looking for there. And what you're looking for is people who, yeah, I mean, they're all there to get stuff for themselves, but they also have a big pie mentality that says, if I help you out, it doesn't actually take anything away from me. I would also say, make sure that you know that you are educated in the basic stuff. You cannot do this business successfully and repeatedly and over the long term without knowing how to figure out accurately what properties are worth, without being able to accurately estimate repair costs, without knowing how to talk to sellers without just basically understanding the difference between a motivated and an unmotivated seller and, and what all the different motivations are without understanding how to source money. Because when you get to the estate builder stage, a lot of, a lot of starters are working with limited funds. And that is a concern to them 
and then they think, well, when I, when I own a few rentals, it'll be great because I'll have all this money. Actually, the reverse is true. As you become an estate builder, your need for money increases. It, it, it not only increases, it becomes kind of eternal. You're always on the hunt for money to buy the next deal. So understanding not just one or two, but five or 10 ways that money is gotten for real estate deals is a big part of your early education. Um, understanding some basic negotiation and rapport building stuff, like, like you, you, you cannot skip that stage and expect to be successful. You cannot skip that stage and expect that, well, that's okay because my connections will somehow do deals for me. I know all these great real estate investors and somehow I can put them all together and they'll make deals for me. Um, if you go out into the world and start making offers and doing deals without that basic knowledge, you're going to end up damaging yourself, your sellers, your tenants, your buyers, if you're a wholesaler. So get that information and make sure that you're getting good information. It really scares me when somebody says, well, I've been studying for six months, so I really feel like I'm ready to go out and do stuff. And I say, well, what, what have you been studying? They say, oh, I, I go to YouTube University. There, there's YouTube videos about everything. That is true. But do you have the perspective as this brand new investor to understand if what you are being told is correct, incorrect, legal in your state, illegal in your state, um, ethical, unethical? And that goes back to that connection, those, those connections, right? That goes back to a really good real estate association is doing good local education and is talking about things like ethics and laws. If, you're, if your group is not talking about ethics and if you're not aware whether or not there are laws about what it is you're proposing to do, you're not educated enough. So in the, in the estate builder stage, I would say, I would say two things. I'm, I'm, I know you've done a lot of these interviews and I'm sure there's been a lot of awesome advice for that, but I'm going to say two things that other people probably haven't said. Number one, do yourself the favor of not abandoning your community when you get to the point where you're super busy and you, you know, you, you kind of feel like you got your little niche carved out and so you don't need any more education and, you got your team put together, so you don't you don't need referrals and things like that that real estate associations give. I can't tell you how many state builders we have seen. They get to that stage, they drop out of Rhea mm -hmm. and Kori, and then they come back five or six years later with their tails tucked between their legs because they thought. You know, I'm, I'm basically done. I just have to keep doing what I'm doing. And man, that is just, that is just a dangerous mental stage when you feel so com confident that you don't need anybody anymore. The cheese is all, come, they go back to the phrase, the cheese is always moving. So it, it when is. you think, when you think you have this thing that's going to work perfectly, the cheese will move mm -hmm. and you need to move with it to where the cheese is going to be. And you've got to modify Oh, and it's really easy to see where the cheese is going when you're talking to other real estate investors every week. Yeah, early, earlier in this interview, you talked about how important the RIA was to you, that you kind of you, you found that you kind of formed a little network within the RIA of people who thought like you did, and y'all talked to each other. But you also had some experience that you went to because they were telling you, you don't know about the dump that's going to be coming into that subdivision. So you had a combination of different people who were helping you on a regular basis. And when I moved into that stage, the, the other thing, so there's two things in that stage that because you were busy doing the thing, you're doing, you're doing rent ups, you're doing turnovers, you're doing um, bookkeeping, you're doing tax planning, you're doing all this stuff, two really important things tend to fall a little bit by the wayside and that is raising money and, and acquisition of new deals. And people, in real estate associations have money that they want to get invested in other people's deals and they also have deals wholesalers right they have deals so staying plugged in even when you're at that point where you're like well i don't need to learn anything else a you do you just don't know what it is until it's facing you and b it's it's part of being the in the community that the community provides 
little local stuff like there's the dump going in and also money if you know how to ask for it and use it and pay it back and also deals so don't don't get unplugged you're probably going to end up regretting that and the other thing that i will say that i don't know if anybody else has probably said is the way the big the biggest threat to your estate building and or enderhood is your government it is the it is the avalanche of anti-property rights thought and legislation that we are going to continue to find falling on our heads and the general approach of the small real estate investor community has always been let them pass it i'll figure out a way around it that has got to stop we have got to stop saying you know, eh, you know, big deal. They they want to make private property ownership basically illegal, but um, it won't affect me. Or if it does affect me, I'll figure out a way to work my way around it. Like every other industry in the world, we all have to kind of individually take on the mantle of I'm going to fight this in every way I can. That might be, it might be anything from writing letters to supporting legislators that are pro capitalism and pro property rights to running for office yourself to writing checks to support organizations that are out there doing this are you thinking yeah. about running for office oh heck no I'm, in your I'm free time i'm unelectable are you kidding <laughs> when, when was the last time a, a a staunch capitalist freedom loving libertarian type was elected to office anywhere. There yeah. might be some small town someplace where I could be elected mayor. I don't know. What sort of sacrifices, the big sacrifices, were required of you to achieve the level of success you've had? Um, comfort. And I mean that I mean that both in the physical and mental sense. You know, there was a lot of stuff that I gave up early on that if I'd had the nine to five job with the benefits, et cetera, et cetera, I knew what my paycheck was every week. I could have just, you know, had cable all the time. But the bigger, the bigger part of that was the mental comfort of I, I'm not scared of anything. I don't, I'm never taking any risk. I I'm always certain about what my day is going to look like tomorrow and how things are going to come out. And not everybody is wired to accept discomfort, which feels like, I mean, it doesn't feel like discomfort. It feels like fear. It feels like terror. It feels like uncertainty. It feels like I'm embarrassed to have to ask somebody how to get out of this problem that I've created. Um, again, it doesn't, it doesn't actually kill you. It, your brain's telling you that there's a saber-toothed tiger in the bushes, but the saber-toothed tiger is actually just a seller who might or might not yell at you when you tell them what you can do for them. But if you if you let the kind of thoughts and the emotions and the, the adrenaline that's shooting into your system convince you that there's a saber-toothed tiger in the bushes and you must run, uh, you and, and you can never use your rational mind to say, okay, what is the worst possible outcome if a seller yells at me? Or if this deal that, I do, that I'm contemplating doing turns out to only be worth 145 instead of 150,000 like I think it is. I mean, you, you, gotta, you gotta be able to use your rational mind and your support system. It always helps to bounce things off of people who know more than you do. You gotta be able to use that until the fear goes away because you've done it often enough that it's just not scary. You understand what the risks are and you're willing to take them. Who are your most important teachers? Well, probably my dad, both for positive and negative reasons. You know, he taught, he taught me a lot and he also taught me a lot about what I didn't want to do and how I shouldn't run things. Um, I got to give some credit to Ron Legrand. He's a he's a very polarizing guy, and you either love him or hate him. And some I feel that way, you know, one way some days and one way other days about him. But he definitely was the one who convinced me about that wholesaling was a a, a good thing to do and taught me how to do it. Um, my dad ran with the 
big four. He was kind of in a similar age bracket with them. So I heard about John Schaub and Jimmy Napier and um, uh, Jack Miller. And of course that young and Pete Fortunato all the way, all the way through my growing up years. And he would always bring back their courses and I would read them. And um, unfortunately, uh, Jack's teaching and my ability to actually understand it only overlapped by about six or seven years before he passed away. Um, but, you know, I really admire those guys, Dyke Spotiford. Uh, but it, it's really been a lot of different people at different stages. You know, I, there, were, there were always people who had stuff I needed to hear when I needed to hear it. And they had an effect on me at that moment in my life and, and pushed me forward in some way. Um, I'm not, I'm not close to them. I don't call them up on the phone, but the, the, there, there are a lot of teachers in your life. And some of them are the formal kind that you buy a home study course from. And some of them are life experiences. <laughs> life experience brings you a lot of learning and it's been a whole bunch of people. It's not, a, you know, it's a team sport. And it is that, um, if you can boil down one, one most important lesson you've learned as a real estate investor. What is that lesson? The biggest? I only get one? One. Oh man. <sighs> plan your business so that you have a life and then follow that plan. It, it's so easy to get fascinated with the, the wealth and the income and the numbers and the possibilities and find yourself looking up and going, I haven't had an actual vacation where I wasn't going someplace either to look at a property or to teach a class or to do something else that, or go to a seminar. I, I talked to somebody that you, you and I both know a couple of weeks ago and she said, well, I'm trying to plan my, my she still has a job with that same company. Yep. Um, I'm, I'm planning my 2021 vacation schedule. So I need, to know, <laughs> I need to know, I need to know when your seminars are <laughs> and where they are <laughs> because, you know, I need to tell them now when I need a Friday off or four days off or something like that. And I said, wait, 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 you understand what vacation time is for, right? It's not for going and working some more in a classroom. It's for unplugging and enjoying yourself and letting your brain work in a way that's not all about my job or my real estate investments. And I don't think I got through to her. But you know, when Kim and I were coming up, every vacation we went on was either a Jack or a Pete or a Dyke seminar. I mean, that's just, that's, that would, and that was for maybe 20 years. And it yeah. wasn't until recently that we started saying, okay, we're going to go to other places. But that was very valuable because we only had so much time, so much money, but that was very valuable time. So I got my alone time, you know, at, at four, three or four or five o'clock in the morning when I go out for a walk when no one, you know, there's no one calling me and there's no body out. That's my quiet time. You realize there's another way to live, right? Yeah. I, but I found that now. Three final questions. Yeah. Wait, wait, wait. Okay. You, you could have found it 20 years ago if you'd been intentional about it. I could have, but I'm really glad I chose. Let's put it this way. If I had a chance to trade $100,000, Jack Miller somehow or another came back to earth, and I had a chance to spend $100,000 and attend one of his one weekend seminars, I would trade the $100,000 so fast to spend just one more weekend with the man. I, I, I understand. However, if you two had had three kids, what would their life for the last 20 years have looked like? That would have been very, that'd been very different because we did not have the kids. So if I had children, we would have gone to Disney. I would have done something different, but that just wasn't our world. So what you're telling me is you would have treated your kids better than you treated yourselves. Yes. I would have wanted them to have experiences you know, I thought what, what Pete did during the summers when his kids were growing up where he put three of his kids into the Volkswagen van and each one got to pick a different place on the U.S. map. 
and said, Dad, I want to go here. The other kid said, yeah, but I want to go here. And he would spend all summer with them in the van driving around the country to go to those four, those four spots. But he said the time the kids spent together is what built their closeness they have now. So, yeah, I would have done something like that because I understand to go deer hunting or go fishing, that quiet time with just family. But I didn't – I was doing what I wanted to do. And, you know, in the beginning, I was doing all the seminars, not Kim. And they got to be where we both went. But it, it, that worked for us. But, yeah, if I had children, everything would have been very different. Don't give up. This is my advice to people. Don't give up entire life during the estate building process waiting for that day when you can do whatever you want. Do I think that's great list, advice. Do, do bucket list stuff as you go along. Not all of it or you won't, you won't build the estate. You can't spend all the money you're making having experiences but intentionally plan out while, while I am doing this, I am also going to work on becoming the kind of person I want to be I'm going to work on having experiences I want to have. Because if you don't, you get deeply stuck in the workaholic. Everything is about building my business and my estate. And when you get to the point where it's built, it's a hard habit to break. And you often just keep doing it. My dad did that. He, he, he could have retired and just not done any more deals. I'm saying, not saying like sell everything, but he could, have, he could have stopped working 12 to 18 hours a day, 15 years earlier than he did. And the only reason he did retire was because he got Alzheimer's and his health would not allow him to continue at the pace or at all. And that last 15 years would have been the best 15 years of my mom's life. But she, she didn't get to have it because he couldn't have it because he couldn't break the, there always needs to be more thing. Yeah. And that, and that part I agree with. So three final questions. What did you do? What did, what did you do right? I stuck with it. I was very devoted to building my education and I plugged into that community. What did you do wrong? I did not keep as much stuff as I should have. The things that I was cheerfully wholesaling from 1996 to about 2003, if I'd have kept two of those a year instead of selling every single one of them, I would be in a much different position with my assets right now. And if you could go back and redo something, what would that be? Same thing. I would, I would, I would keep very carefully selected properties that I liked well enough that I would still want to own them today. And I would have put them on a financing plan or schedule where today they would be paid off. Vina, you're one of my heroes. I always enjoy our time together. I think you're absolutely remarkable. I think the abilities that you bring to the table as a teacher, as a deal maker, as a leader, are absolutely phenomenal. You're one of a kind. And I'm very grateful for our time together. Thank you. I'm glad to have been here. Thanks for asking me. <laughs> you're welcome. Say goodbye. Wait, wait, how, how do people reach you? If they want to reach you, how do they reach you? Uh, oh, I wasn't prepared for that question. Um, my website is therealestategoddess.com. I can be emailed at askvina at gmail.com. That's A-S-K-V like in Victor, E-N-A at gmail.com. Perfect. Thank you, Vina. Bye.